You are listening to Ultimate Triumph, a full summary of end-time Bible prophecy based on the book of Revelation, chapters 4 through 19. Yes, we're on the winning side, for we serve the conquering Christ. These eight prophetic messages encourages the listener to look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draweth nigh. Luke 21:28. The speaker is your pastor, evangelist, and Bible teacher, Charlie Greer. The next voice you will hear will be that of Pastor Greer. Our message today is entitled, The Stolen Title Deed, based upon Revelation chapters 4 and 5. The setting of the story is on the cheerless, rocky little island of Patmos, the time possibly A.D. 95. It is Sunday morning, and John, far from home, and all human companionship should have been downcast and forlorn. At least this was the expectation of Domitian, the Roman monarch who had banished him there. And why was he there? Revelation 1.9 explains, For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Far from being depressed, John wasn't even thinking about his own plight. He was in the spirit, praise God. How long he had been engaged in his private devotions, we are not told, when suddenly he finds his entire being totally enraptured by the blessedness of the divine presence, wrapped in his power, as the Amplified Bible so aptly translates this phrase. Captivated by the spirit, a great panorama of past, present, and future events began to unfold before him. In chapter 1, he receives a new revelation of Jesus Christ, portrayed in beautiful, symbolic language. In chapters 2 and 3, he sees the church, past, present, and future, exactly as heaven sees her, and the description was not altogether complimentary. In chapter 4, he was caught up to heaven and given a ringside seat from which vantage point he could view fast-moving events that would one day take place on the earth. In chapter 4, God the Father is honored as the great Creator. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. In chapter 5, God the Son is honored as the great Redeemer. Thou art worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people, and nation. In chapter 4, the throne of God is in full view. Down through the corridors of Old Testament history, those living close to God had from time to time been given glimpses of that throne. Isaiah saw it as a glorious throne. I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. Isaiah 6, 1. Daniel saw it as a prophetic throne. I beheld till the thrones were placed, and the ancients of days did sit. Daniel 7, 9. It is an eternal throne. The four and twenty elders fell down before him that is seated on the throne, and worship him that liveth for ever and ever. Revelation 4, 10. It is also a judgment throne. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. Revelation 6, 16. Look for a moment at the eternal aspect of the throne. Most authorities believe that John was caught up to the throne in spirit to view those things that will take place on planet earth after the church has been raptured out of the world. 
Now, if this be the case, is the throne John sees erected at that time for John's convenience? Of course not. God's throne has always been and always will be. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Psalm 45, 6. We believe in the futuristic interpretation of Bible prophecy, but there are some things in the book of Revelation that are eternal. The throne of God is one example. Salvation is another. Our Lord is eternal and timeless. When John was called on high, it was as though he had been invited to step into God's time machine in order to view man's redemption from the eternal viewpoint. The things we read about in the book of Revelation do not necessarily take place in the sequence in which they are recorded. The apostle is, as it were, attending a great seminar. It is conducted and directed by God himself. The Holy Spirit is in charge, otherwise neither John nor we would be able to understand or retain the message. Being human, John could not possibly grasp everything at once. And so we have the oft-repeated phrase, after this, after this. John is absorbing those remarkable revelations as rapidly as he is able to comprehend them. But it is still precept upon precept, line upon line. Isaiah 28, 10. The events recorded in Revelation will not, for the most part, take place in chronological order. They are merely written in the order in which they were revealed to John. As we move into chapter 5, we see in the hands of the Father a legal document, for it is sealed with seven seals. John lived in the days of the Roman Empire. According to Roman law and custom, any legal transaction was written in duplicate form, usually on parchment. Whether it be will or title deed, one copy was filed openly for all to see. The other copy was sealed, generally with wax, and given to the rightful owner or heir to the property. Normally such a document was written only on the inside, but the document that John saw in the Father's hand was so important and so detailed that it was written within and without. The importance of this document cannot be overemphasized. When John perceived what it was all about, and when it seemed no member of Adam's race could qualify to break the seals, John wept much. We are told this could be translated, sobbed audibly, or sobbed audible sobs. Why should the apostle sob audibly because of this document? Here may be the first or one of the first keys to the understanding of the book of Revelation. Some miss the entire message of the book because they fail to grasp the meaning and importance of the seven-sealed book. To fully understand why John wept, we must go back in time to that memorable day when deity met in divine counsel and unanimously declared, let us make man in our image and let them have dominion over the earth. Genesis 1:26. In the infinite foreknowledge of God, the possibility of man's fall was discussed and his ultimate need of redemption. Can't you just visualize the Son of God stepping forward at this point and volunteering his life for the redemption of mankind? It is altogether possible, too, 
that the father may have responded something like this. Son, in order to redeem the human race from sin, it would mean that you must leave the ivory palaces and go down to a world cursed and warped by sin and there identify yourself with a race of people with twisted minds and stubborn and willful hearts. You must be willing to lay aside your glory, the glory that you have had with me from all eternity. You must be willing to become a helpless babe in a woman's arms. You will be hated and scoffed at. You will suffer physical and mental abuse. You will be rejected by the world that you love and hated by the very people you have come to save. It will mean death on a cruel tree, accompanied by shame, open exposure, and reproach. You will face the temptations, trials, snares, and opposition of the devil from the day you take your first mortal breath until the day you expire in agony on the cross. You will suffer the very worst that earth and hell can bring upon you. You will be deserted by your friends on earth, and all heaven will turn her back upon you, because you will become the very personification of evil and the total embodiment of every sin that will ever be committed by the combined members of the human race. If you are to redeem the race, you must face the cross entirely alone. You must also be willing to experience the awful agony and loneliness of a lost soul in hell. For it is written, Thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Isaiah 53, 10. It will be this spiritual separation from me that will be harder to bear than even the physical suffering on the cross. In the light of all this, my son, are you still willing to redeem the human race? Then without hesitation, I hear God the Son respond, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Hebrews 10, 7. Now the question might be asked, when does all this take place? Is it directly after the rapture of the church? We have already declared it is not. Rather, this planning and this decision took place, in the words of Scripture, before the foundation of the world. In the mind of God, our salvation was planned and executed in minutest detail before man was ever created, and even before the earth itself had come into being. Whether this is to be measured in thousands or millions of years doesn't really matter. Hear these words from the pen of the Apostle Peter. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. 1 Peter 1, 18-20 Look for a moment at this seven-sealed scroll. I believe that scene in heaven around the Father's throne took place before man was ever created. John was permitted to go back in God's time machine and view the entire plan of redemption. Some have called this seven-sealed scroll the sealed book of judgment. Well, it includes that. But can you imagine any member of the human race sobbing audibly because no one could qualify to bring judgment upon the earth and upon the human race? This scroll 
in the father's hand was certainly more than a logbook of impending judgment. A note in the Pilgrim Bible reads as follows. This book, or literally a scroll, so thoroughly sealed like a legal paper, is the title deed to this earth. Go back to Genesis 1 and 3 and read how the right to rule the earth was given by God to man, Adam, who forfeited it to Satan. At the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Son of Man, conquered Satan to get it back for man. But he has never actually taken it, and will not until this time come. Until then, Satan is the prince of this world. John wept because he had a sudden vision of what it would mean if Satan had the right forever to rule this world. Unquote. Do you get the picture? On the cross of Calvary, Christ defeated Satan. When he cried, it is finished, as recorded in John 19 and verse 30, Satan was conquered and man was redeemed. Praise God. Had God chosen to do so, he could have lifted the curse from off the earth on the very day when Christ rose triumphantly from the dead. He had at that moment conquered the whole realm of nature, including man's most dreaded enemy, death. Christ could have at that very moment bound Satan and cast him into the bottomless pit. But for reasons best understood by an omniscient God, he chose not to do so at that time. The best place to produce victorious Christians is in a world of strife where one is constantly subjected to the temptations and opposition of the devil. God would have a tested and tried people, and this is undoubtedly one reason why Satan is still at large in the world. The earth is still under the curse, and a totally defeated enemy is still flaunting himself as God of this world. He is the great deceiver, the great frightener, and the great discourager. He scoffs at Calvary and boasts that the world is his and that he can bestow power and authority as it pleases him. We must remember, however, that Satan can only exercise authority as God permits him to do so. He is not the true king of the earth. He has merely usurped that power. As of now, however, God has not restrained him, so he goes on deceiving and enslaving those who refuse to put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has been given more and more power with the passing years. This point is proven in the book of Job, where first Satan is permitted to touch only Job's family and earthly possessions. Later he was granted permission to afflict Job's body as well. And this sort of thing is still going on. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He has access to the throne of God, and he is permitted to test God's people in many ways. But he can only go as far as God permits him to go. Eventually, the accuser of the brethren will be cast down. Revelation 12:10. Presently, he is being given more and more power. As Satan exercises more and more power on the earth, men become more and more sinful. In 2 Timothy 3.13 we read, But evil men and seducers will become worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. In the last days, Satan will even demand worship and he will be universally worshipped, as we read in Revelation 13 and other scriptures. 
In Elijah's day, the false prophets were unable to call down fire from heaven as Elijah did. But in the last days, Satan will enable his man to perform even this miracle. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven in the sight of men. When the true church is gone, and the Holy Comforter no longer indwells the believers as he does today, the salt of the earth will be gone as a restraining force in the world, as we read in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. The Holy Spirit will, of course, be in the world, but he will now be operating as he did before the day of Pentecost. Satan will then come down to earth and virtually take control of this planet. But Satan's little heyday will be short-lived. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Revelation 12, 12. The devil is a liar and a deceiver and a thief. He stole the title deed of earth when he persuaded man to sin in the Garden of Eden, and he will continue to pretend to be the God of this world and King of the earth until a stronger than he, the Lord Jesus Christ, wrenches the stolen title deed from Satan's cruel grasp. Who is able to take the book and rescue the earth from this cruel monster? The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to take the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Praise God. Yes, this is what the book of Revelation is all about. In Revelation 5, 2 we read, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? The key word is worthy. Who is worthy? No man who ever lived or ever will live could qualify. Why? Because only the spotless Lamb of God could meet all of the qualifications. This fact is best illustrated by the little story of Ruth in the Old Testament. You remember the story. It is one of the most beautiful love stories ever written. You know the Bible is a love story. The story of God's love for a lost world. Here in the book of Ruth, we find Naomi going with her husband and her two sons down into the land of Moab during the time of famine. As might be expected, the two young men reach the age of maturity while there, and both marry Moabite girls. Disaster strikes the family, and the father and both the sons die. Poor Naomi. She is a God-fearing woman who may not have wanted to go down into Moab to begin with. Then word reaches her that times have improved back in Israel, and she decides to return. At first, both daughters-in-law determined to return to Israel with her. How very unusual! Naomi must have been a godly woman to have caused both of these young women to love her that much. She was able, however, to persuade Orpah to return to her own people, but not so with Ruth. This young woman truly loved her mother-in-law, and I believe she loved her mother-in-law's God as well. For she declares, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to turn away from following after thee, for where thou goest I will go, and where thou lodgest I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death part thee and me. Ruth 1, 16 and 17 this was true loyalty, but it looked like all was lost. In going down into Moab, Naomi had lost the family's inheritance, 
and now both she and Ruth were paupers. But here is where the true love story comes in. A well-to-do farmer falls in love with Ruth, and best of all, he happens to be related to her former husband. According to the law of Moses, only the nearest kinsman could redeem Ruth and the lost estate. But Boaz was not the nearest kinsman. Another man was closer related than he, and this other man wanted the property also. However, there were three qualifications that must be met in order to redeem the property. One, he must be able to pay the price. Two, he must be willing to pay the price. Three, he must be willing, if necessary, to mar his own inheritance. The first man was able, and he was willing, to redeem the estate until he discovered that Ruth was involved, and then he declined because he was unwilling to mar his own inheritance. Boaz loved Ruth so much, he didn't care how much it cost. He was willing and able to pay the price. Moreover, he wasn't concerned about marring his own inheritance. So he became the kinsman redeemer. He married Ruth, and that happy couple became the great-grandparents of King David. This story parallels that of our great kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. The whole human race had lost their inheritance through the sin of Adam, who broke off fellowship with God and wandered into a strange land. To redeem the race, Christ had to become our kinsman. That is why he left the ivory palaces and was born in Bethlehem's manger, that he might become a part of the human family, a part of the human race, near kinsman, if you please. He alone was able to pay the price of our redemption. He alone was willing to do so. He alone was willing to permit his own inheritance to be marred by identifying himself with us, lost and sinful though we all were. He became our near kinsman in order that he might redeem our poor souls and restore our lost inheritance. In Philippians we read, Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Can you feature that? God the Son, who was in every way equal with God the Father, chose to come to earth not as God, but as man. He identified himself with sinful man, even though he himself was sinless, and then died in our place to pay the penalty of sin, and thus redeem us and bring us back into fellowship with God. Who is worthy? Christ is worthy. He alone could qualify. He was able to redeem our lost inheritance. He was willing to pay the price in full. He was not concerned about his own inheritance being marred. And so we read, Thou art worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God a kingdom of priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now what does the fourth and fifth chapters of Revelation tell us? Simply this, that Satan has robbed us of our proper relationship with God. He has also usurped the title deed to the earth which did not belong to him, and he pretends to be the God of this world, a position that is not rightfully his. It tells us that Christ, our great kinsman redeemer, who became the lamb slain when he died for us on Calvary, has now, through his glorious resurrection, become the lion of the tribe of Judah, 
and is going forth as a mighty conqueror to wrench the stolen title deed from the hands of Satan, the great usurper. Now please turn over the tape for a companion message entitled, Christ the Mighty Conqueror and the Day of the Lord. <laughs> 